And to kick off the night, we're actually going to start with a fellow that couldn't be here tonight. Um, Catherine Galvin is a fourth year chemical and bioprocess engineer who is now down in on an internship in Cork. So we're going to play a video she set up. My name is Kat Galvin and this is my video presentation for my project Adapting Aeroponics for the Innovation Academy Technology and Creativity Fellowship. Unfortunately, I couldn't be here today as I'm on placement in Cork. So to me, the fellowship isn't just about the projects. It's also about the people in the projects. And as I can't be here in person today, I'm going to give you an intro into who I am as a person. So to start, let's begin with the story. When I was five years old, my friends and I used to play with these snap crackers, which made a sound when you threw them on the ground. They were all the rage, really popular, very exciting stuff for a five-year-old. So what I did was I saved up all my pocket money and bought every single box in the local shop so that there was none left. I then sold them to my friends at a higher price to make a profit. I was five. This gives you a pretty good insight into who I am as a person. Now I'm a UCD chemical and bioprocess engineer and I'm working with a pharmaceutical company called Abvi making drugs. I've worked at Intel previously and in Ted and Bengil for a year on exchange. Outside of academia and professionalism, I love having side projects and making cider is a current interest of mine. I'm also a huge bike enthusiast. So let's get into it. There's certainly a few faces in the crowd thinking, what is aeroponics? So let's get everyone on the same page. Aeroponics is a system for growing plants in mist. Usually, the root of a plant is suspended above a volume, where mist is sprayed onto them. A pump pushes water around a closed loop, where water goes up through the piping, through the spray nozzles, and falls back down again, and this repeats the cycle. It's a technical enough process, and NASA are responsible for a lot of the aeroponics research. Think plants in space, very techy. So why is it so great? Why is aeroponics amazing? Well, it uses 98% less water than standard agricultural practices, uses no soil and no pesticides, and plants can grow a lot faster. Seems to be a win all around. However, there are issues with aeroponics. For the purpose of this project, industrial issues have been ignored as we are focusing on small scale production. Let's focus on the urban issues for today. If you don't know how to build an aeroponic system for yourself, they can almost be inaccessibly pricey to buy. As well as this, you need a very good technical background to know how to use aeroponics. If you're unfamiliar with science or with gardening, it's a tough system to learn how to build. This means not many people have access to it at home, which is an issue. That's where adapting aeroponics comes in. Over the next several months, I will adapt this technically difficult system so that a normal person can use it in their home using this highly detailed post-it schematic, which includes real life plants. I will build a closed loop system which will pump water up and around a sloped pipe, which will spray the roots of the plant and allow them to grow. This one is placed on a windowsill to use up the dead space in the house. Another prototype is based on the top of a radiator to use the dead space there. I'm hoping to incorporate recycled plastics into the manufacturing of this system. So what I'm doing first is learning how the process works. We must learn before we can teach. I'm going to find out what works and what doesn't work and apply this knowledge to my own system. Currently, I'm building a version of the system shown. I have my PVC, my misters, my frame and my volume. A few more bits and we'll be sailing. So what's the point of it all? To you in the audience who are similar to myself thinking, okay, this is great, but how will this make me money? Well, I have an answer for you. STEM is the new trend. Almost everything has been turned into a kit and sold. Be it an intro into electronics, intro to chemistry sets, intro to coding, Raspberry Pis, the list goes on. However, there hasn't been an affordable intro to aeroponics, and there's your gap. That's why I'm today I'm asking you for an investment of, kidding, don't worry. I won't ask for an investment just yet, but I will ask for any advice and guidance along the way if you think you know of anything that can help. So let's summarize. 
Aeroponics is the future of farming and in the next decade, it'll be the it thing. Think about Bitcoin before it blew up. That's where aeroponics is now. Aeroponics does have its problems, yes, specifically price and the knowledge needed to run it. Adapting aeroponics will alleviate both of these issues. Adapting aeroponics will introduce a simple way to use aeroponics in your home for a cost-effective price. Grow those herbs using a great system and save money, money while you're at it. Thank you very much for your time. Please, please get in touch if you have questions or would like to hear more about adapting aeroponics. I can be reached at this email or this contact number. Thanks again. Next up we have Emily Blay, a mechanical engineering student here in UCD. His project is called Brace Yourself and it's around the idea that pots and pans are way far too heavy for a lot of people to handle nowadays. Take it away. Thank you very much for that wonderful picture. <laughs> <laughs> My first sentence was going to be me introducing myself, so you stole that from me. <laughs> um, can I... So, uh, my project name is Brace Yourself, Get a Grip, and that will, the name will explain itself uh, by the end of the presentation. So, like I said, I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer, so start off with a typical saucepan, and let's make it into a free body diagram. So, in a, in, a, in a heavy pot, you have force going down from the middle of the pot. Um, and you, when you're lifting the pot, you're putting a force upwards, and there is a distance between them. And that means that that's going to twist out of your hands and put a great strain on, it's going to put a moment around it, and then it's going to put a strain on your wrist. Now, this is fine for us young and strong people who can take it and go to the, the gym and lift weights, heavy weights voluntarily, <laughs> um, and do all kinds of things there. But for people who have uh, conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, or just generally they're getting older and weaker and they can't uh, ma maintain their hobby of cooking that they loved when they were younger, um, we need a solution for this. So, um, my project, Brace Yourself, takes an idea from a, a different product which requires a brace, a slingshot, which also causes a huge moment about the wrist and is solved by this uh, arm brace here. So I figured, how can I adapt this for um, a pot, a pot handle? So, have you got, how, hands up who has seen this life hack on the internet? It's, okay, a few of you. So, it's basically, with the pot, there's a hole in the end of every pot handle. It's used for, it's actually used for hanging it up on a wall, but people say, okay, this is what it's actually for when you have your wooden spoon, put it in there, and it keeps it out of the way, and drip free, right? So, I thought that was pretty clever, but um, for my idea, why don't I just flip it around and use an arm raise there? So the main original idea was to adapt it to every pot handle on the market and have a, a universal system that you could just buy and attach to your own pots. Um, I did a little bit of research and all the pot holes are different sizes. Um, I did a bit of experiments and it also means it doesn't work in, uh, as I would expect. This, so I put it on a shelf and thought, okay, I'll come back to it once I do a little bit more figuring out. In the meantime, an alternative is this. This is a pot gripper that is sold usually towards the camping and outdoorsy market because they can't have pots with handles on them. So I figured if I can't adapt their handles, I'll, I'll just make my own. So um, this is the first version. Um, it had a lot of issues, but it was a really good proof of concept. It worked well, but um, it wasn't comfortable and it wasn't feasible for a general audience. I, I experimented with the pistol grip, which didn't work. Uh, it was good and bad. Anyway, uh, I'll talk about that at my stand. Um, this is the Mark II version. It solved a lot of the issues, but it wasn't quite there. One of the main problems was people are different sizes. So if, you have, if you're a really tall person, then you're going to hold a pot differently than if you're a really short person with a really high countertop. So in the Mark III version, I added this feature right here, which is it adapts the angle of the brace to any person's height. You set it once and it works for you. Um, and, that's, and that's where I'm at at the moment. Going forward, uh, that allows it to uh, go back and forth. I haven't got my animations all synced up. Um, going forward, I'm going to revisit the original idea of adapting the pot handle to every pot, which is more accessible and actually allows you to have a lid on the pot while you're carving, which is important if, you, if you're if you safety conscious as well. Um, if any of you have any ideas or suggestions, I will really welcome them at my stand um, when this is all uh, at the end. So thank you very much. That's me. <laughs> We have Connor Foy, whose project Demand Response Powerwall has been looking at trying to solve the problems with it in Ireland's renewable energies. All right. 
Hi, everyone. Um, um, so I'm Connor. I'm a third year experiment physicist. Um, so my project was to try and investigate demand response power walls. Um, so the aim of it was to create a network of small battery storage units that would be able to charge up during the night and then run appliances during the day. So this would be able to ease the peak demand of the Ireland's grid um, during the evening. So I'll explain that as I go. So the four things I'm going to cover is the daily electrical grid demand, uh, how we can recycle dead laptop batteries uh, to get the good cells out of them, what a power wall actually is, and then the results of my investigation. So this is a graph of the daily demand. So you can see during the night there's a very low demand and then we sleep. And then as everyone comes home in the evening, she starts to cook their dinner, there's a huge peak um, around six o'clock. And this is the what we want to kind of tackle. So what Ireland does to try and meet this peak is it has a whole lot of power gen power plants running on idle, so they're just burning up fuel, kind of rotating, not actually producing any power. So this is incredibly inefficient. So this is what we want to try and stop. We want to reduce this, this number of power plants. Um, so what we what I want to do is to link these battery storage units. So instead of having huge power plants, like one huge power plant, everyone has a small power unit and each contributes to the solution. So I also decided that a good way of sourcing these, these batteries was to use dead laptop batteries. So when your laptop battery dies, there's actually a number of cells inside it, and it's usually only one or two of these cells that have actually died. So the other four or five are still usable, still have good life left in them. So this brings us off to what a power wall actually is. Well, it's a device that charges up during the night, stores that energy, and then can use that energy to run appliances during the day. It has three main pieces. A power supply, which takes your uh, socket, your main power supply, drops it down to a lower voltage that you can use to power to charge your battery. The actual battery, which stores all the energy, and then an inverter, which is the opposite of a power supply, takes that low voltage and runs it back up to a higher voltage to run your appliances. So this can be used to take to charge up during the night when there's low demand, and then run during the day when there's a higher demand. But having uh, research this topic, we found that if you were to implement 10 million of these cells, then this small little orange blip at the very top is all the effect it would have. So on a large scale, it, it would need to be implemented on a huge scale to be able to actually make any difference. Um, the other thing about that is 10 million is actually an unrealistic number. There's only, Ireland only recycled about a million, so 1 million AA batteries last year. And there's way more AA batteries being used than laptop batteries. Um, the last thing, the last uh, problem with this solution is that the yearly maintenance. These batteries, because they're being reused, there's only about a year left in them. So they probably have to be uh, exchanged every year to try and keep the system running. So they're not as sustainable as the project really needs. Um, so in conclusion, um, although this is a, is a good idea and it would like in theory, solve the problem. Uh, these these recycled batteries are too limited a resource. They're because their lifetimes are too short. They're not sustainable. Um, we still need to tackle this problem. We still have a huge carbon emissions that we need to try and reduce, um, and increase our efficiency kind of across the spectrum. These re re the, these uh, re recovered laptop batteries aren't the solution. And hopefully, if we use new batteries or other sources, we'll be able to tackle it. Thank you very much. Um, kind of strange introducing myself, but next up, myself and Anya have been working on a project called Heart Humidity. The idea being we're trying to bring Irish dancing into the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Anya, and this is James. We are the How To Movie Team. So, when I say Irish dancing, what do you think of it? Probably Michael Flatley, arms glued by your side, the wigs, the dresses, the craziness, right? But I don't think anybody actually thinks about the music or the rhythm. So, with that in mind, I'm going to show you this clip. What did you think about that? For me, I found this noise 
monotone. It's so annoying if you hear it over and over and over again, like me for probably 18 years, it gets annoying. So the sound is monotone, but don't get me wrong, this was a world-class Irish dancer. But complex rhythms got lost because he's not expressive and he's not changing in dynamics. This is kind of like the Bairon and the drum kit dilemma we've got going. The Bairon actually isn't considered a, a percussive instrument because it can't do the same things that a drum kit can do. But you can actually play the same rhythms on the Bairon as you can do the drum kit. Just like you can play the same rhythms on your feet as you can do the drum kit. But if a drummer watched an Irish dancer, he'd say, oh hey, it's cool you can do that with your feet. But he'd never say, oh hey, I saw that triplet, that was cool, or that was an off beat, that was kind of funky. So with this in mind, I'm going to show you another clip. What a headache looks like. <laughs> it is the um, practice room before the world's fire chanson, and it is mayhem. Okay, so it's noisy, there is a mishmash of sound, and to be honest, it's pretty pointless practice because your trainer is going to look in front of you and she won't know what's going on. She's going to hear your one over there, she's going to look at your one over there, and what's the point? Okay, and this is kind of like when you're dancing at home and your mom's trying to watch the TV and you're there banging out some tunes and she's like, please, just stop. Okay, it's a problem. <laughs> so with this in mind, we came up with a solution. Our solution is called Musical Instrument Digital Interface, which is MIDI. And this is kind of like a launch pad of the And so a launch pad is basically when you map a sound to a button. You play the button and it makes the sound. So for us, it's kind of like then playing a keyboard. So you play the keyboard and it sounds too. So for us, we're going to put this into our shoes so that when you stamp or when you go up in your toes, a sound plays. And when we have this, we can actually turn this into earphones so that you can use your shoe that doesn't actually make a sound. But you can hear your shoe and the sound um, going on in your earphones. So you can go to the practice room and you can play away and nobody will hear you and you won't be interfering with anyone. So this is what we have going. And James is going to talk to you then about our food. So narrowing it down to how do we implement this practically, we have to try to figure out what we're trying to do. So in essence, we're trying to figure out what these three events are, how can we isolate them when we're working with senses. So technically, we have the stamp, the toe, and the heel. Uh, so far as how we implemented this, we used a motion sensor using accelerometers and gyrometers. Um, we have a video here of the very first uh, Google tests we were doing, and it kind of shows it off pretty well. Um, it's really janky, it was literally tied to my shoes at the time. <laughs> um, here we have a new version to show off later. On the left, you have a control play. So, yeah, I expect I can do it. Recording? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, this is our dancing shoe version negative five. Um, no idea anything usable. Uh, on the screen, we can actually see accelerometer values fr the, from the shoe. So, when I'm not moving, it's not reading anything. So, hopefully, we can determine between a heel. A toe and a stamp, using these as triggers and then tr using the orientation along with that uh, to figure out what actually has happened. Uh, as well, we can actually detect uh, different movements. So anything quick, anything we can determine. So the essence of that, I know, I know it was quite hard to hear, the essence of that being we can actually determine very easily when an object hits the ground using motion sensors. And then from there we can figure out if it's a heel, a toe, sorry, a heel, a toe or a stamp by looking at simply the orientation of it. So from there we kind of try and figure out what can we actually do with this. Because obviously if we're stuck it into a shoe and it stays in the shoe, there's very little we can do. We're not going to be allowed to bounce a loudspeaker with anyone's leg anytime soon. So then we run into an issue of communicating it out. How do we do this in a very busy atmosphere that's very easy to do? So working with a, a simple microcontroller like a mic, uh, Arduino, this isn't possible. So we scaled up to looking at a far more powerful called ESP32 that has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in. With the Bluetooth the protocols for 4.1, we can actually allow a person to connect two headphones for the person training and their trainer so they can listen to their rhythms. We can then also communicate it to a base station that can then use the musical instrument digital interface to push that to whatever we want, whether that be lights, sound, we can trigger anything off that. So what was the main issue with actually implementing it? Because obviously I don't have it done here and so far I don't have it done here either. So the problem is we are have the event happens and then we have to process the information and then turn it into a sound. So what is our leeway so far as this? What is going wrong? Well, with humans, we can deal with a certain bit of like, like lightning. We can see it and then hear it a couple of seconds later. With, from this distance, with this sort of item, 
we get about 50 milliseconds with which we can do everything we need, and if the sound doesn't come in, at, in within that interval, our brain <coughs> says something is completely, completely wrong. So that was the issues we were going into. But we actually think we've solved it using a local Wi-Fi network that we're running between the devices. Okay, with all this in mind, you're kind of wondering, what's next? So for myself, I'm actually looking at code that hooks up our software Ableton with our shoe. So it will recognize that our shoe is a device. And also then I'll be turning the shoe instead of this hard tap into a softer tap that you actually can't hear, hopefully. Um, or at least it won't know you. Um, and James and I was then working on actually fitting the software, sorry, the hardware into the shoe. And then he's also working um, with that wireless um, network as he was talking to you then. But this is only for an end. We have a bigger dream. So our dream is going to interact LED lights with our dance. And ideally we'd love to see this as an actual show so that it's more expressive. The whole point of this is so that music, will, you can actually see what's going on as well as hear it. So the lights will be interactive with the shoe, excuse me. And also then I actually um, don't need to name drop here, but I, <laughs> I'm in a scholarship with Jean Butler at the moment. And her idea at the moment is to and change the way we look at Irish dancing because it's not athletic, it's not banging out a tune, it's actually feeling the music kind of like any other form of dancing. So I'd really like to, um, when we have our prototype done, we'd like to show that to her and um, really get that going. So thank you very much. So next up, um, I don't spell out Freddie Gold, not by choice. Um, me and my team from Perspectives are also up again. We're talking about how we're going to use virtual reality to try and tell stories from the shoes of the people that need to tell them. All right, hi, my name is Amarina. Um, I am an undergraduate student, English with Drama. Um, I'm also a mature student, so I worked in film professionally before I started my degree. Um, our project is called Perspectives. Experiencing the world through the skin of somebody else. And basically, one of the things that we noticed about the world is um, that there's a problem that people have with communicating their experience to other people. So here is a solution that one girl had to that. Make my smile. Say something funny. Oh, blah, blah. Eh. Oh. Where, uh, where are you going? Oh, okay, I see. Come on, what, is it because I'm ugly? Huh? Is it because I'm ugly? <laughs> is... Yeah, um... <laughs> so, what she has done is quite similar to what we want to do, except um, she's used a third-person perspective in order to communicate um, how annoying it can be in some American cities when you're getting hit off all the time. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, what we believe is that there is no better way to understand the experience of somebody else other than to experience it yourself. And virtual reality really gives us such a profound opportunity to be able to do that. Um, what we want to do is we want to create three mini-movies. Um, the topics that we're working on, uh, the first one is homelessness. Um, I... Uh, sorry. I sat down with um, a friend of mine who used to be homeless when he was a teenager and we had about a two, three hour chat um, about what it was like and what he feels the actual difficult parts are and um, how he felt that other people kind of misunderstood the experience. Um, one of the things that he said was that a lot of people um, commented on, oh, how, how terrible must it have been that you were so cold all the time. Or what about when it rained on you or if it was snowing? And what he said was actually the worst part of being homeless was the loneliness. Um, and that you forget to communicate with other people. That it feels like you're out of your body. You're watching your life happen to you. And it's the same thing every single day. Um, so that's something that we really want to be able to communicate authentically through our um, homelessness experience. The second topic that we want to work on is called Man Up Little Boy. Um, it has to do with the transition from boyhood into manhood. Um, a lot of little boys are told to suppress their 
emotions and it causes them to have difficulty in maintaining <coughs> intimate relationships with other men, um, have anger issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we really want to work with that. We're really passionate about that. Um, and the third topic that we want to work with is race and how we want to do that is we want to show the same day um, through three different races. Um, and I will hand it off to James to discuss some of the technology for you. So again, we're our community of tech. That's really my passion. What we have here is the stereoscopic 360 degree camera we've been using. And so to embark upon this journey, we really had to understand what we could actually do. So with this camera, there are eight separate cameras within it. And to get VR, which is stereoscopy, um, we film from two different places to simulate your two eyes. And from, with that, it brings with it a lot of difficulties. So when you're filming with this, uh, you have to stitch together these four separate images and get out. And that becomes very difficult, especially if items are too close, then you start to see a line that shows exactly where the two things can be joined together. And as such, we had to do a lot of experiments about how we could film, what we could film, what were the limitations around this. What we came upon is that on the corners, we need about one and a half meters a meter. And as well, we weren't, be, we weren't going to be able to show looking down at yourself, looking at your hands, or any of this sort of thing. So that really limited us when we were looking at how we were going to film the race uh, series. Then we were looking at, could we achieve motion? And one of the things we really ran into that was quite funny um, is that you, can't, you can move up, but you can't move down. If you move down and someone is sit, seated viewing this, they start to feel like they're falling through the floor. A very strange thing to deal with, but a very new technology. It's something we're just going to have to work with as we go. So like James's passion is tech, my passion is people. I am a politics and sociology major, and I'm going to talk to you about where we want to take this project. Um, and so basically our target audience is hopefully everyone. We feel this is a project that can um, in entertain and it can also um, teach a lot of people. Our objectives are, of course, to make people understand how everyone's feeling. And for platforms, we're looking around. We don't want to just release this video on YouTube. We're hoping to do it on a grander scale. Hopefully as an installation piece in a museum or something. And we've been looking at the Tech Museum of Innovation in San Jose, for the science galleries, and um, as much as that, here's our projected timeline. So we're hoping to finish our homelessness video by the end of March, then man up the little one for March and breaks for April. Of course, it's preliminary because we're still not sure about the tech. But then hopefully by late July, we'll have released our films and they'll be available to everyone. So thank you for listening and I'll we'll talk, we'll talk to you soon. <laughs>
And what that allowed me to do is I could print flexible filament reasonably reliably, um, but it also meant I could attach two different motors to the printer. And that led me on to a uh, second area of research that I did, which was into dual extrusion. And what's good about that is, initially, I was able to print with two different colors of the same material, and that's how I ended up with those two models, the cat and the cow there. And they look great, but it's more interesting for me as an engineer to try to mix the materials around a bit. So you might want, for instance, like a high temperature part, but a stronger part on, a, on another part of the same model. And dual extrusion can offer that by uh, mixing the two materials together in <laughs> however you want, really. Uh, so I've been doing a bit of research into that for the last week or so, and I have, I have a test print that I can show you as well. Um, and yeah, the other thing that I was interested in trying was, I'd seen this online done, and it seemed really cool, was to attach a pen to the actual printhead and then print a normal file, and the pen would be dragged around the failed area as you would normally be extruding plastic, but you obviously have a drawing picture. So that's how I ended up with these three uh, quite nice drawings. Um, and yeah, I designed, I designed my own little mount for it and everything, and it mounts quite nicely to it. I haven't myself come up with any good use for it, but I can see it being used by maybe artists or people who want to be artists, but like me can't draw. So if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them. But uh, it's quite a nice little showcase piece at the moment. Uh, and then, yeah, some of the other things that I've been able to change, because the code is open source, I can go in and change all the features in the background. Uh, the firmware for those printers is a bit old now and lacking because things move on very quickly in this industry. So I was able to implement um, some sort of nice features that you have nowadays, like yeah, filament runout sensor, so you know if you're out filament. Um, I'm able to dynamically change the print or the, the, the filament during print. Um, I can change how long the feed paths are in the firmware. And I also added a few user interface menu options as well, which is just all sort of stuff that's nice to have. Uh, and then, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I've been up to the last while. So next up, we have the team from War Chess. And what these guys have been doing is trying to take the conventional game of chess and bring a more physical element to it. There we go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming. Uh, I would like to start with uh, introduction of the team. My name is Akin, and to my left we have Sarabi and uh, Oban. And today we will be introducing to you word throw pattern of chess. Well, before I start, I want to ask you guys a question. How many of you are interested in chess, like the game of chess? Okay, all right. Uh, how many of you are not interested in chess, but you're kind of bored? <laughs> all right, fair enough. Well, uh, chess is a board game. And uh, it has evolved alongside we human beings. It's gone from uh, like a normal board game. Uh, it's played internationally as well. Uh, now it has come to computers, and now it's it's come to us in virtual reality. And I'd like to pass it off to talk more about virtual reality. Yeah. So how many people have actually played virtual reality game here? Okay. Quite common. So uh, yeah. So virtual reality is basically evolving, right? So earlier it was uh, just a a big head mounted display where you had to wear a lot of stuff and then play. But now with uh, Facebook coming in with Oculus Rift and then HTC coming with HTC Vita, HTC Vita, which is like simple uh, this and you just head mounted this. So uh, we have been thinking of uh, doing a, a game in chess where uh, we could play it virtually. Okay. Uh, so what's uh, <laughs> so these are the basic uh, current applications which people have developed, which have played uh, a basic chess board game in virtual world which is uh, a quite new, right? So people actually didn't think of playing it in a virtual, in a virtual reality. So now I can will describe what we are actually doing. So uh, from this slide you can see, this is the, this is the first game that I've actually, or the first chess game that I've been implemented in a virtual reality. And this right here is an animated uh, chess game that has, that's just physical computers. And what we are trying to do 
is combine those two games mm -hmm. and make mm -hmm. a more interesting, more fascinating game for those of you who like playing chess and those of you who don't like playing chess. Uh, yeah, so basically that's literally our idea. What we're trying to do is put you as the character in the game, if you understand what I mean. And uh, basically, I'm going to pass it off to, to Ravi to talk about the scripting and coding. So the current progress which we made is uh, we customizing the source code, then we C and C sharp scripting, and uh, we code the chess pieces in code just that the game is working and it's in working condition. And uh, we want to implement uh, different themes, so we uh, model the chess piece using Blender and making people have a Lego on the top as well. And if you are made happy with the texture, this looks like that in the game. And we are trying to implement different kinds of things like war theme, Game of Thrones theme, and then in the coming future probably Minions theme. <laughs> and the video is going to get. Next up we have Josh King. Uh, Josh has been working on implementing a Wi-Fi mesh network as a way of relieving congestion in this uh, world of more and more technology devices. Take away. <coughs> Hi, uh, my name is Josh. Um, I'm an undergraduate in computer science and I'm going to be talking about Wi-Fi world um, through mesh networks. It sounds complicated. Essentially what I'm trying to do is make Wi-Fi speed fast. The problem I'm trying to address is that um, Wi-Fi connections become really, really slow and un unreliable when too many people connect at the same time. This effect is really amplified in large buildings like UC Science, um, and it's just because of the sheer volume of people trying to connect. So the contributing factors to this problem uh, include the time of day. So for example, uh, during lunchtime, everybody goes to Thai. <coughs> Uh, to get lunch, and when they do, they all go on their phones. Um, when everyone's connecting at the same time on their phones, uh, the connection gets really slow because everyone's trying to connect at the same time. This also ties into location. When everybody moves to Pi, moves out of the classrooms during lunchtime, the connection speeds in the classrooms are really fast because no one's trying to connect to uh, the Wi-Fi there, but if you try to connect at Pi, it'll be really slow. Um, another factor is uh, kind of frequency, so a lot of devices, uh, laptops and phones can be configured to run on different frequencies uh, to connect uh, to Wi-Fi, and that can alleviate traffic, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. And lastly, uh, hardware. Obviously having more expensive hardware is going to give you better connection speeds, but I'm not going to be looking at a hardware solution because that is expensive and it requires maintenance. This is why I looked at software solutions. Um, the goal is um, to use software to maximize unused hardware. So if everybody's in, in Pi and there's a whole bunch of equipment in other parts of the building, how can I use software to utilize that equipment? Uh, minimize collisions. So make sure that users don't interfere with each other, step on each other when they're trying to connect. Um, the less collisions, the faster speed you get. Um, and lastly, give every user equal access. So. Um, make sure that no one user has really fast, fast speeds and other users have fairly any speed at all. The technology I look to implement to tackle this problem was, is something called a mesh network. It's essentially a network that 
uh, distributes traffic among uh, different locations in the building uh, through a peer-to-peer -peer connection. It's also called a <coughs> ad hoc mobile network for more technically defined. Uh, so I'll explain how this works. Um, when you connect to Wi-Fi, uh, how it actually works is from your laptop or your phone, first connect to something called an access point. Um, right there, there's an access point there. Um, and those devices are connected to the network backbone, so ECD wireless. ECD wireless, uh, the backbone can have all sorts of different devices, um, routers, firewalls, etc. This is what um, access points look like. Like I said, I think actually that one is really similar to the one on the left there. Um, that's essentially what your phones and your laptops are connecting to. Uh, to expand this further, uh, say four users were connecting to an access point here. Say, call this the Pi access point, access point one. Say, in a classroom, for example, during lunchtime, when there's only two people there uh, connecting to access point two, the one in the classroom. Obviously, the one in Pi is going to be really congested. It's going to be at full capacity, 80% usage. But the one in the classroom is going to be um, under less stress. What a mesh network is going to do is instead of the users directly connecting to the access points, they'll first connect to each other. So uh, as you can see here, user 4 tried to connect that to access point 1, but saw that it was at 80% usage. So what the program would do is instead of connecting to access point, Point one, it'll make the decision to instead connect directly to user 5's laptop, mm -hmm. and then through user 5, direct the network flow to access point 2, for the one in the classroom, for example. Um, by doing that, the, the load is distributed among access point 1 and access point 2. Well, this would be um, considered a pure mesh uh, implementation, and it would be the most ideal solution. Um, Cross-platform development, so development for Mac and Windows, is um, a large task, and so I sought to um, implement uh, a hybrid solution. So instead of the users directly connecting to the access point or to each other, they'll first connect to what looks like an access point, but is actually a series of devices I've labeled here as a mesh network layer. So each, each of these are going to be mesh nodes that connect to each other, and these uh, nodes will make the decision as to where the traffic balance goes, and then connect to the access point. This layer essentially acts as a buffer between the users and the access points to spread out the traffic evenly among a large building. The mesh nodes that I talked about earlier, I am going to be implementing on this really inexpensive, low-power device called the Raspberry Pi. I have one over there, I can show you later. Um, by strategically placing um, a large number of these across the building, um, people will be able to connect to this first, these devices will automatically distribute the load across the building and then hopefully improve <coughs> speeds for all users connected. So, so far, um, I spent a large amount of time experimenting with the Galileo, the Intel Galileo platform. These are small Raspberry Pi-like devices that um, Intel gave us. Um, for a number of reasons, I decided not to go with it and now I'm moving on to the Raspberry Pis. I have now got the mesh software running, uh, and the next step would be to get a large-scale mesh network op operational. I've also completed an auxiliary project that started from me trying to figure out where the loads are, um, and I found that there's no good way to do this. So I created a program that will automatically um, get the network speed every five minutes, and then automatically push it to Google Sheets for easy enough. Going forward, I, I like to complete a mesh network and try to implement it at least in UCD science with the Raspberry Pis. And I would like to optimize and implement a low distribution algorithm. And if I have time, I'd like to develop a UI for it for easy management of the Raspberry Pis. Thank you very much. Rachel Dogan, who has been working on uh, working on a project trying to look at whether we could teach people to play piano and other complex instruments in a brand new way.
We're just going to have to go over it. Um, so, hi, my name is Rachel Duggan. Um, currently, I'm a third year neuroscience student. Um, the, reason, the purpose of my project here is the neural connection stability. So, it's using neuronal impulses to, of the musician to replicate melody in modern technology. So my project's target audience is basically, the reason for it was neurorehabilitation. So essentially when I was in neuroscience, one of the main problems that I became aware of was the fact that a lot of people in Ireland and around the world, they suffer with conditions that will essentially debilitate their neuro nervous system. So one of the things that I wanted to look at was neurorehabilitation because essentially what the problem that we are currently experiencing around the globe is the fact that there is being so many, like so much money is being implicated into budgets and countries are going to have to budget so much for physiotherapy and for basically occupational therapists like lessons after a person has experienced things such as a stroke or if they've gone through vascular and neurological or degenerative diseases. These things take a lot of time and unfortunately there's a lot of waiting lists so one of the things that I wanted to tackle was something that could be accessible to everybody, something that everyone would have in the home and that they wouldn't have to wait 72 to 90 days to see someone who can only see them for 40 minutes. It's not practical, it's not efficient, and it's wasting a lot of time and money that governments could be spending in other areas. One of the things that I learned in neuroscience when I was a very young year in the first year it was a topic called neuro neuroplasticity. So essentially it's something that not many people are aware of is that neurons in a healthy individual, someone who may not have genetic dispositions or any genetic complications, your motor system or your nervous system has the capability of building its neurons back up if it's at all damaged with strokes or with other things such as vascular and neurological problems. It takes a lot of repetition and a lot of time, such as with physiotherapy lessons, but it is possible because you're essentially retraining and restructuring your, plas your neural um, plasticity. So one of the things that I looked at for my project was something that was inspired by a TEDx talk. It was done by Greg Gage. And essentially what he did was he took a person from the audience, hooked them up with some electrodes, one on their arm and then one on their hands to ground. He had then took another person from the audience and with a simple Arduino controller, he was able to ask the person to simply clench their fist and automatically the other girl was taken from the audience to clench her fist automatically too without even being aware of the thing. So what essentially, I looked at this video and I thought, why not use this in a more medical term and a more physiological term? And say, take a person who doesn't have much control of their muscles because they've been through a stroke, they've lost that definitive muscle power, and say, why not train, get a person who's trained with their um, musical instruments? So I would take a musician, a piano player, and have them play two simple chords on the piano, have them hooked up with this Maya band, this was meant to work for the presentation, but unfortunately it didn't sync. But this would essentially be placed on your forearm. It has a eight sensors, and it has the gyrometer and the, all the accelerometers and everything like this. And it will take the different areas of your muscle of your forearm, the two chords we place down, and then this will be automatically, there will be EMGs, the EMGs will be categorized, and from that, it'll be brought into Arduino. The Arduino will see the EMG, it will know when to stimulate the other person, and the other person will be stimulated, and then the person will automatically play the chords at the same time as the musician. So this is what I'm looking at. I have the piano, I have a Maya band, which I, because of um, talking with different professors in engineering, I was able to get access to, <coughs> and then obviously the Arduino, and then this is to represent the motor neuron that's being regenerated and with many repetitions within your home, it will then be allowed to start regenerating. <coughs> so obviously this project has been a new experience for me. Obviously I have knowledge in neuroscience being a third year, but one of the things that I found rather interesting at the start was I was focusing on something that wasn't necessarily my interest. I was looking at other things that involved electronic engineering and things that I wasn't necessarily passionate about. But one of the quotes that I learned was, by seeking and blundering, we learn. So I've obviously made a few mistakes along the way. One of the main ones that I made was at the beginning, I saw this wonderful TEDx talk by Red Age, and I thought that I could simply implement that by using the finger muscles.
but obviously with a lot of more research, I realized that the physiological terms of that isn't as easy as it would seem. I was told by a lot of engineering professors that it's a master's, pro a master's project, essentially, because the physiology within the hand itself is quite complex. And if you were to stick electrodes on your hand, it's so sensitive and it has to be so incredibly precise that unless you have wonderful equipment, it's going to get lost in noise and essentially you're not going to get any data. So what I had to do is I had to go back to the books and think, well, how else could I go around this problem? And that's when it came with the myoband and using it on the forearm instead, using those muscles instead to bring the fingers down, which is essentially teach the person how to do it instead. And my last slide is that ultimately, obviously, my aim for this project is one of the slogans of UC Innovation Academy is you connect minds, and I hope that figuratively and literally that I'll be able to connect people's minds and bring something forward that will hopefully be a really good method for your rehabilitation. Thank you very much. That's us for the evening. Thank you very much, guys. Um, we are not quite finished. So these are the presentations where everyone gave you the uh, overview of what exactly they're doing. And if you have any questions or you want to talk to them, or you think you, something in your head that they might be useful knowing about, we're all going to be here with all sorts of demos and tests around the room that you can come around and check out. But again, thanks for coming, and have a good night.